Uh, welcome back to Natural Language Processing. Uh, we are going to continue now with the unit on discourse analysis. So discourse analysis is very different from most of what you've seen in natural language processing so far because it deals with uh, information that goes across sentences. Very often the documents that we're going to process and analyze have multiple sentences. Any news article, uh, story, and uh, uh, fiction work has mo many sentences. So many, there are many issues with discourse that we need to focus on uh, computationally. Some of them are listed here. The first one is called anaphora. So anaphora is a Greek word and it is used to refer to um, expressions that correlate with some earlier occurrence in the document. So for example, if I say, I went to see my grandfather at the hospital, period, the old man has been there for weeks. Uh, the phrase the old man refers to my grandfather and its use in the sentence is anaphoric. And then the last sentence, he had surgery a few days ago. Again, we have an instance of anaphora. The pronoun he is used to refer back to my grandfather. So one of the goals in computational discourse analysis is to be able to group those three expressions, my grandfather, the old man, and he, into one set so that we know that they refer to the same person. So there are two concepts that I want to introduce at this time, that of a referring expression of an antecedent. So the referring expression in the examples above was something like the old man or he, and the antecedent was my grandfather. So anaphora is a problem not only with multi-sentential text, but also within single sentences. It is completely possible and frequent that an anaphoric expression or a referring expression may refer to an antecedent back in the same sentence. So what do we need to do uh, to address this issue computationally? Well, the first thing that we need is a model of discourse that tells us how do people actually go about generating text that includes anaphora. So the moment we understand how they do it, it will have an easier time uh, computing uh, their intent. So let's look at some other phenomena related to discourse. One of them is coreference. So for example, if I say, uh, John saw Mary in the park, period, as every morning she was walking the dog. So what does she refer to? We have to be able to figure out of all the words in those two sentences what it can possibly refer to. First of all, we know that it has to refer to uh, a named entity, uh, uh, sorry, it has to refer to a noun phrase. Uh, so the noun phrases are John, Mary, Park, every morning, and her dog. So how do we know uh, which one of those is the correct antecedent for she? Well, let's think about it. Every morning is clearly not a person, whereas she has to be a person. So we have a, a discrepancy here. Uh, another discrepancy is, again, similar in nature, is the park. The park is not uh, something that we can refer to as she because it's inanimate. John is uh, a man, so we cannot refer to him as a she either. So we have a gender agreement. Her dog is a possible uh, reference, but the structure of the sentence makes it impossible for that to be the right antecedent for she. So the only thing that is left is Mary. And we can check that, in fact, it makes sense. It has the right gender, the right animacy. It's an animate person and it appears previously in the discourse. So some of those features will be used in the computational analysis of coreference. So there is an uh, annual competition, at least there was an annual competition called MUC uh, that had a uh, specific task on coreference extraction. And for that evaluation, uh, the participants were provided by uh, NIST uh, with a large collection of documents that were annotated for coreference manually. So here are some examples. It's very difficult to read those, so you should probably pause and uh, read this carefully. Uh, the idea here is that we have some sentence, like the Russian airline Aeroflot has been hit with a writ for losses and damages filed in Hong Kong, and so on. So every entity here is marked with some number. For example, the Russian airline Aeroflot is ID 6, whereas uh, Hong Kong is ID 15, and so on. So the goal here is to figure out which of those entities refer to one another. So let's look at some examples of those. So in the second paragraph on the slide, you can see that some of the uh, named entities have references that point back to some other entities. So all 75 people on board the Aeroflot Airbus, we have Aeroflot named, marked as a named entity and Airbus also marked as an entity. And you can see that Aeroflot has an ID of 10, but it refers back to the entity numbered six. And then later on, when we have the pronoun it, it has a new ID, 11, but it is also identified to co-refer to the named entity 12. 
So using this kind of data, we can build uh, automatic uh, systems that use classification uh, to take into account every single uh, occurrence of a pronoun or other anaphoric expression and look for possible antecedents and use uh, features to determine what is the correct one. So let's look at some other properties of this course. I looked up the definition of a screwdriver, the tool on Wikipedia. Uh, here's roughly what it looks like. It's a fairly long paragraph, so you don't need to read the whole thing. A screwdriver is a tool, manual, or powered for turning screws and so on and so forth. What you need to pay attention to, however, is the presence of some discourse structure. So for example, the word the shaft and the tip and the word handles and so on are introduced at the beginning of sentences and they refer back to uh, objects that are introduced directly or indirectly in the previous sentences. The same thing applies to the word these uh, in the final sentence. So how do we do co-reference resolution? As I mentioned before, we need to look at agreement constraints and also positional constraints. So some of the agreement constraints that make sense are gender, for example, male or female, uh, number, uh, singular or plural, animacy, you know, animate and inanimate. We can also look at syntactic constraints, for example, parallelism. We can have two sentences that have roughly the same structure and we can use that information to determine which uh, anaphoric expression refers to what. And the order of the sentences is also very important. Anaphora specifically is a phenomenon that refers back to earlier occurrences in the document. Uh, there is a similar term called cataphora, which refers to uh, referring expressions that point to antecedents that appear after uh, them. So an example of this would be uh, with uh, its new role in the movie, comma, uh, Brad Pitt is going to become even more famous. So in this expression, uh, his appears before its antecedent Brad Pitt. So this is an example of cataphora. So in sentence ordering, recency is very important. The most likely antecedent of a referring expression is within the current sentence earlier on or in the previous sentence and rarely uh, in some earlier sentence within the same paragraph. Very rarely would you see instances of anaphora that refer back to uh, entities introduced in the previous paragraph unless there was some intervening anaphoric expression that refers back to them in the current paragraph. So I'm going to go now to an example uh, based on a paper by uh, Lapin and Lees from the early 90s where uh, for the very first time they looked at the computational treatment of coreference. So they manually com came up with a list of rules that tell you, given a list of candidates for uh, anaphoric uh, resolution, what properties of those make them more likely to be the correct antecedents? So here are uh, the seven uh, properties that uh, Lapin and Lise were looking at. I'm going to explain them on the next slide in more detail. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, sentence recency is the most important feature. If an entity was introduced in the same sentence as the anaphoric expression, it's more likely to be the correct antecedent than one that was introduced earlier. The other features that count for the largest number of points are subject emphasis, that is when the entity is the subject of the sentence, and so on. And I'm going to explain them on the next slide in more detail. So how do we deal with recency? Uh, if an entity uh, is a candidate uh, to be the antecedent of a current referring expression, every time we cross a sentence boundary, its weight is going to be cut in half. So this effectively uh, gets rid of expressions after a few sentences. And in fact, Lapin and Lise also have a rule that says that after four sentences, uh, all the candidates get removed. And here's some of the examples for the different features that they use. So for example, uh, for subject, an Acura Integra is parked in the lot. So Acura Integra is a car and it is the subject of the sentence. There is an Acura Integra parked in the lot. This is an example of the second feature. That's an existential predicate. The third example is John parked an Acura in the lot. In this case, Acura is the object of the sentence. John gave Susan an Acura. This is an indirect object. And finally, in his Acura Integra, John showed Susan his new CD player. So this is an example of an adverbial prepositional phrase that includes uh, the candidate reference. And as you can see, in the order in which I show them, we, can ha we have a, an even decreasing likelihood that uh, that particular word, the car, is the antecedent of a pronoun that appears later on. So let's run now to an example that was uh, described also in the Jurafsky and Martin book. 
Uh, this is a, uh, an example of uh, the procedure described by Lapin and Lees. Its name is Resolution of an Afro Procedure. It's called also RAP. And in recent years, there has been an open source implementation of this algorithm by uh, Minyan Khan's group at the National University of Singapore. So uh, let's go through the algorithm in more detail now. Uh, we're going to take an existing um, referring expression and we want to disambiguate it. So for this purpose, we're going to collect all the possible reference up to four sentences back. We're going to remove all the potential reference that do not agree in number or gender with the pronoun. So in one of my earlier examples, we had John and then she. So John would be removed in this example. Then remove all the potential constraints that do not pass intrasentential syntactic reference constraints. What that means is that if the sentence doesn't make syntactic sense with that particular referent, we're going to ignore that. And then we're going to compute the total salience value of the referent by adding any applicable values uh, for things like row parallelism, which gives us an extra 35 points, and also catafora, which actually removes 175 points. And then uh, once we have added all the uh, feature scores, we're going to select the referent with the highest salience value. And if there is a tie, uh, the tiebreaker is going to be uh, the closeness to the currently disambiguated expression. And then, uh, just so that we can also take into account recency, uh, when we move to a new sentence, we're going to halve all the scores of the existing entities on the list. Okay, so now let's look at an example from Jurafsky and Martin with three sentences that it shows how the Lapin and Lease algorithm works for pronoun resolution. The first sentence talks about the following. John saw a beautiful Acura Integra at the dealership last week. Uh, he showed it to Bill. He bought it. So we have four pronouns that we need to resolve. The first one of them is he in the second sentence. So at this point, we have three candidate reference, John, Acura Integra, and dealership. So let's see what kind of scores they each get. They all get 100 points because they are in the most recent sentence. In addition to that, John gets 80 points for being the subject. Integra gets 50 points for being the object. Uh, they get, none of them get any points for uh, being in an existential phrase or being an indirect object because those are not present in that sentence. The three expressions also get bonus points for not being in an adverbial phrase, and they also get bonus points for being the head nouns. So the total number of points for John is 310, the total number of points for Integra is 280, and the total number of points for dealership is 230. So at this point, the algorithm is going to tell us that John is the most likely antecedent for the word he, because it has the largest number of points. So uh, at this point, we move to the second sentence. Now we have to disambiguate uh, the pronoun it. Since we have crossed the sentence boundary, we have to um, halve the values for each of the antecedents. So John is still available as a candidate. However, its score gets dropped from 310 to 155 points. The score for Integra gets dropped in half and dealership as well. So uh, since we have added he to uh, the group that involves John, we now have a phrase cluster, John and he one. He one means the first occurrence of he. And since he now is in the current sentence, that cluster is going to get the sum of the points for John and for he. So 310 plus 155, that's 465. So at this point, John is still the most salient entity in, in the uh, discourse. Now we are going to move to the next example and we're going to disambiguate it. It's going to get a high score because it matches uh, the right features. And in that case, it is going to refer to Integra. Uh, its new score is going to be added to the old score for Acura Integra, therefore raising it up to 420. So at this point, John is still in the lead and Integra is now close behind. But still, if we had to choose at this time, we would still go with John as the default instead of the Integra. And then after we have processed the rest of the pronouns, we're going to get this sort of structure where Bill uh, gets also an additional number of points, whereas dealership doesn't have any uh, reference uh, at all. So it's going to keep its lowest score, 115 points. Then after we move to the end of the second sentence, we have to halve each of those scores again. And that is going to keep their relative order, but the absolute values are going to be smaller. And we can continue until we reach the end of the discourse. Okay, the next topic that we want to discuss is going to be about coherence, and that will be in our next uh, slide.